<laughs> All right, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Jake Light, one of the first year fellows. Uh, welcome to another iteration of Imaging Conference. We've got three interesting cases for you today. So case number one is a 38-year-old male who presented to the Wills ER with pain, photophobia, and decreased vision in the right eye now for two weeks. Dr. Sivalingam, would you walk us through the pictures? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> this is a wide field pseudo color fundus photo of the right eye. Uh, vision is count fingers at six feet. Um, media appears possibly slightly hazy. Um, disc margin overall looks crisp. Um, vasculature, hard to say it's a little hazy. Superiorly looks okay. Um, maybe some attenuation out here in the periphery. Um, and then definitely inferiorly, there's definitely some attenuation. Um, hard to say for sure, this looks like maybe a sclerotic vessel here out in the temporal periphery. Um, and then most notably, we have this kind of diffuse retinal whitening in the inferior half of the retina kind of starting kind of just in the inferior macula and extending out into the periphery. Um, possibly a small hemorrhage out here in the temporal periphery. Um, yeah. Any comment about this here? Oh, yeah. yeah that's interesting. So <laughs> a bubble sign. Um, <laughs> you know, that makes me wonder um, if the patient either had you know, a recent surgery um, or some type of recent intraventral injection. A reasonable assumption. How about the left eye? Yeah, so left eye, vision's 2050. Media looks much more clear here. Disc margin overall looks normal. Um, vasculature. Maybe some slight tortuosity, although nothing dramatic. Um, definitely more robust um, than the fellow eye. Um, you can see out here in the temporal periphery, there's this kind of cluster of these kind of mix of hypo and hyperpigmented atrophic looking scars. Hard to say if that's like a laser scar um, or some type of prior trauma. Um, and then, you know, macula looks fairly normal. There's a nice nerve fiber layer sheen. Um, and then, hard to say for sure, there's kind of this area of kind of granular hypopigmentation kind of infratemporally to the macula. Maybe similar here. Um, hard to say for sure. All right, thank you. And then we have a fundus autofluorescence of the right eye. Again, media looks rather hazy. Um, kind of have a normal hyper autofluorescence, the macula. Um, and then a very slight hyper autofluorescence, perhaps inferiorly compared to the um, superior retina. And this correlates to that area of retinal whitening that we saw in the color fundus photo. Yeah, agreed. Overall, though, fairly bland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So uh, left eye, um, and you do see the, these kind of areas of hyper autofluorescence correlating to those kind of subtle areas of hypopigmentation that we saw in the color fundus photo supertemporally and infratemporally here. Absolutely. We have an OCT vertical cut through the right eye. The overall um, signal is degraded, and I assume that's from the media opacity that we were seeing in the uh, fundus photo. Most likely. Um, you know, the vitreous here, the, the overall image is rather grainy, but possibly some vitreous debris. Um, and then uh, nerve fiber layer looks relatively normal. Um, inner retinal laminations look grossly intact. Um, outer retina, at least um, superiorly, looks intact. However, you do see 
disruption of the outer retinal layers uh, here, the ellipsoid zone is kind of missing. Um, choroid overall looks relatively normal. Um, and then we have the left eye vertical cut. Um, media or image quality overall looks much better. Vitreous looks clear. It looks like they do have a PVD. Um, nerve fiber layer, inner retinal layers look normal. Um, An outer retina looks intact. Choroid looks overall normal. Good. Yeah, I do think that you can see a little bit of the hyaline face here. So still a young guy. Okay. Uh, no PVD here yet, but I agree. Otherwise, essentially a normal OCT. Okay. And then this is just to capture a little bit of that area. Obviously, it was yeah. a little bit peripheral, but anything on this scan through the yeah. superior macula? So, you know, we were wondering about that area kind of super temporally and infratemporally. This, may, this cut maybe catches it here. So if we look um, at the outer retina at that area, there is some subtle disruption um, of the um, ellipsoid zone here. Um, the inner retinal, inner retinal layers, grossly normal, maybe a little bit of disruption here. Yeah. So IVFA, the right eye, we're at 29 seconds here. Um, looks like we're in the uh, early venous laminar phase. You do see some laminar flow here. Um, Pretty good arterial filling superiorly, but then when you look inferiorly, especially infratemporally, we do see kind of this attenuated, delayed filling um, in the area of the retinal whitening, and then you kind of see this kind of diffuse, granular, hyperfluorescence uh, um, in the inferior half of the retina in the area of the retinal whitening. Right, and this early, so maybe suggesting some sort of a little window defect yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Early choroidal. Um, and then we're here at 43 seconds. Um, now we have better arterial filling in those areas um, that were delayed previously. Persistent kind of granular hyperfluorescence here. We don't see any significant hyperfluorescence around the disc to suggest any leakage. Um, and macula overall looks OK. Um, yeah. um, here we have the left eye at a minute and 51 seconds. Um, good. Um, so this is full arterial venous phase. We see these. Um, areas of scarring that we saw before, you know, these kind of blotchy areas of hyperfluorescence, probably some type of window defect um, from those scars, although we'd have to see um, later frames to confirm. Um, and then disc looks good, macula looks good. You do kind of see this subtle um, hyperfluorescence um, in those areas that we saw um, in the um, fundus autofluorescence. Agreed. And then here we're at two minutes and 30 seconds. Um, kind of see more um, prominent hyperfluorescence um, over here, infranasally, inferiorly, infratemporally. It doesn't quite follow um, the vessel, so hard to say if it's definitely leakage from the vessel. Um, and disc still looks okay. Mm -hmm. The optic nerve is a little hyper. Yeah, maybe a little bit here, but. Yeah, I've always been under the under understanding that sometimes on the optos, the disc can look hot. Do you think that that's truly inflamed, Dr. Civilino? I mean, it, it, it looks to me like it's mildly inflamed, but let's see the later frames. Three minutes and 17 seconds, left eye looks overall pretty similar to the earlier frame we saw at a, just over a minute. These areas that we were seeing look, you know, relatively stable. I don't see any increasing um, hyperfluorescence. There's up here. some up here too. Yeah. Yeah, again, corresponding to those areas that we saw on the 
fundus autofluorescence imaging. So just to give a little bit more background about the anterior segment, so uh, IOP was a little bit higher in the right eye, 23 relative to the left eye. The AC in the right eye did have 2 plus cell and 2 plus flare, uh, and the vitreous was noted to have 1 plus cell and 1 plus haze. Left eye, though, was uh, completely quiet in the anterior segment. So with this sort of presentation, what are you thinking about on your differential? Yeah, so, you know, with the vitreous inflammation and the pretty significant retinal whitening, the first thing I'd be worried about is some type of viral retinitis. Um, you know, it'd be atypical for toxo with this pattern. It's very diffuse. We don't see any old scars, um, but you can't rule it out for sure. Um, always want to think about syphilis. Um, although it doesn't, you know, you don't see the typical placoid lesion, but certainly you can see it, um, syphilis present in other ways. Mm -hmm. um, tuberculosis. Um, those would be the main things. I guess you could ask, you know, I'd want to know further history. If they live in a wooded area, you could always think about Lyme, um, but it's not a completely typical presentation for that. Yeah, so you're thinking really infectious, inflammatory sort of etiologies. Sure. Yeah. Does the vision count fingers correlate with the OCT findings? <laughs> why, why is the, my question is why is, is there a divergence here or does it correlate Mira or Jacob? So I think that there's an element of poor cooperation. I think the patient was quite photophobic during exam in clinic when we were finally able to get the photos. So I agree with you. I don't think that the OCT image looks like a count fingers fundus. And honestly, the amount of inflammation and haze didn't look uh, commensurate with that either. Um, so I think some of it was a little bit of some poor cooperation with, with the examination. Unless it's optic nerve related, but it's not overly lighting up either. So. Right. And there was no APD documented, um, but uh, all good thoughts. So uh, I essentially agree with uh, Dr. Sivalingham's differential. Um, viral, toxo, syphilis were all on there, Bartonella and Lyme. The only other one that I had added uh, really was a BRAO with some inferior whitening and some uh, you know, vascular attenuation. But I agree, I don't think it looks uh, very typical of that. So is there anything, say you're seeing this patient in the emergency room, anything you want to do right now? Yeah, I'd, I'd probably. Um, get an aqueous tap um, to send for a viral PCR, so VZV, CMV, HSV. Um, we also typically send for toxo as well. Um, and then I'd probably get some basic lab work, so CBC, CMP, um, syphilis. Um, you can think about getting a chest X-ray um, and sending for an ACE. Um, and then, you know, I would probably inject um, with phoscarnet just to cover them for um, a viral process mm -hmm. um, and probably start them on Valtrex. Um, yeah, so essentially working diagnosis of ARN yeah. with the vitreous haze and the retinal whitening. Mm -hmm. So I agree with all that, and that is indeed what was performed in the ED, aqueous tap, uh, intravitreal phoscarnet, started on PO Valtrex. And then the question of what additional studies, uh, so syphilis on there definitely, tuberculosis. Uh, we did end up sending for an HIV test as well, given the concern of you know, CMV or syphilis. Um, and then ultimately, the patient did end up getting blood cultures. And actually, a sickle screen was ordered, given that vascular attenuation in the temporal periphery on the left eye with um, some scarring, though the patient denied any history of laser treatment uh, quite adamantly be really atypical for CMV retinitis to present with pain, redness, and photophobia. Yes, absolutely. So any additional history, aside from the fact that no, he didn't have laser treatment, <laughs> that you would like to know? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd like to know just like basic medical history, um, any history of um, malignancy or anything that would um, make him immunocompromised. Um, you always want to ask about social history, um, um, any new... Anything in particular from the social history you would want um, to Yeah, I'd probably on. ask about a sexual history. I mean, we got an HIV, um, so you want to know if they had any, you know, new partners, um, or any risky behavior. Um, 
Great. Yep, I agree. So patient has a history of hypertension and COPD, but no diabetes. Uh, he's a smoker, but no alcohol. And he did actually state he is sexually active with both men and women and has been active uh, within the last month. Uh, denies any known prior history of sexually transmitted infections, but does have uh, unprotected intercourse with both men and women. No personal or family history, though, of autoimmune disease that he know of. So I'll give you some of the laboratory results. Uh, HIV came back positive with a viral load of 639,000 on a CD4 count uh, quite low at 98, and this was a new, new diagnosis for him. And syphilis also came back positive with an RPR of one, uh, with a titer of one to 256. He did end up having a lumbar puncture and the CSF uh, testing uh, was negative. The uh, TB, ACE, chest x-ray, and sickle screen were all negative. Uh, and then the AC tap, which was sent, was also negative for viral and toxo-PCR. And then ultimately blood cultures were negative. And what about the FTA ABS? Uh, positive. Both were positive, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did he have any skin lesions? Did you look at his hands? No, he didn't have any uh, classic kind of palmar rash. No other manifesta manifestations that we were able to elucidate. So is that bubble after the phosphornet went in? So exactly. So he had the tap and inject. There was a little bit of air that got injected. And so when we got imaging the next day in clinic, there was a little bubble there. It did resolve. So just a couple notes about ocular syphilis. Um, classically, syphilis is known as the great masquerader. Uh, and it's called that even within the eye itself because it can affect essentially all ocular structures. And you can see a list of just all of the areas of the eye it can affect and the various manifestations that it can, it can uh, present. It can present both in early and late stages of the disease. However, the chorioretinitis and vitritis are often more common in the late latent and tertiary phases, whereas anterior findings can be uh, present earlier. And even just within the retina and vitreous findings, you can see there's a number of different ways that this can present, ranging from chorioretinitis, necrotizing retinitis, all the way to even the CRAO or CRVO sort of presentation, uh, and even exudative retinal detachment. The juncture of syphilis and HIV is an important topic to remember, and that is because you know, HIV co-infection within people with syphilis has been documented to be as high as between 20 and 70 percent, depending on the series that you look at. There is an 86 times higher risk of syphilis in HIV-positive individuals as well. Higher HIV viral loads and lower CD4 counts have actually been reported again and again in patients who have concurrent syphilis. And this is thought to be due to maybe two primary reasons. Number one, the mucosal ulcers from syphilis are thought to enhance transmission of HIV. And there is thought to be increased immune activation in patients with an active immune response to syphilis, which may ramp up replication of the HIV virus within the host cells. Question of how does ocular syphilis present, at least in the retina, with differing CD4 counts? This has been looked at. Um, a review in the literature in 2011 uh, asked this very question. Interestingly, in their series, they found that um, in patients with a CD4 count less than 200, uh, they had 93% of them presented with only a posterior uveitis, and they defined that as inflammation in the vitreous and the retina but no inflammation in the anterior segment. However, a series that came out of India just last year, a uh, report of 56 eyes uh, with ocular syphilis, uh, did report the presence of panuveitis, or that is both anterior and posterior inflammation in patients, even with CD4 counts less than 100, so a differing result from the, from the prior uh, series. They noted that the diffuse retinitis phenotype, which is the one seen all the way on the left in these images, uh, did actually present in patients of all sorts of CD4 counts, but was more common in patients with a CD4 count less than 250, as opposed to the placoid uh, phenotype, which you can see in the uh, middle photo. There were only six eyes with this sort of presentation, so somewhat anecdotal evidence, but uh, all of them had CD4 counts greater uh, than 400. It was never seen in the severely immunocompromised. So our patient did indeed get admitted to the hospital. He underwent 14 days of IV penicillin treatment. And you can see maybe a little bit of improvement in the retinal whitening here, though a little equivocal on this uh, pseudo color 
photo, but patient was definitely more comfortable, able to tolerate exam better, uh, measuring 2080 in that right eye. And you can see maybe some resolution of some of that outer retinal disruption here after a full 14-day uh, course of penicillin. We'll move on to case two, unless there are any other thoughts. So JP, you were convinced right from the beginning this is not a viral retinitis? No, I was convinced that it was not CMV retinitis. Okay. And it didn't look like uh, ARN. It wasn't a full thickness retinitis, at least that we could see on the uh, images on the OCT. Now, those didn't go out peripherally that far, so it's a little harder to tell. Uh, but that, that patchy retinitis would be less typical for viral retinitis and more typical for syphilis. Right. But I, I totally agree. But you would have managed it the same way. I'm sorry? You would have still managed it the same way like we did. Absolutely. Yeah. He's not going <clears> to... <throat> he's not going to lose vision acutely from the syphilis. He could lose vision you know, over a couple of days from acute retinal necrosis. So <clears throat> while it's less likely you have to treat the, the disease, it's more likely to cause rapid visual loss. I have a quick question. I always wondered, you know, syphilis, it's one of the few conditions where you can have your outer retina kind of wiped out, but after treatment, it like miraculously comes back. And uh, JP, do you have any thoughts on like wh how that's possible? Like what's going on? Uh, I don't know the mechanism. I mean, we'll see that in other diseases. For example, you can see it in white dot syndromes. Uh, if you look at the outer retina in multiple evanescent white dot syndrome, for example, and those patients typically recover just about full vision. But why some people have those changes and, and other patients don't, I mean, I assume it has to do with how much actual photoreceptor death there is as opposed to swelling or dysfunction. One last question. Two weeks is enough in a case like this of penicillin? Yeah, there's no indication that treating longer than two weeks provides any additional benefit. His well, CD4 count was low, and... Um, would it have been low enough that he didn't develop a Jerish Herxheimer reaction um, uh, during the treatment because his RPR was pretty high? Did he have any uh, decreased vision and increased flare in cell initially, or or no? No, he he looked just better on our exam. We didn't see that he worsened. All right. Case number two. This is a 41-year-old female who presented to our office uh, with reports of acute vision loss in the right eye two weeks ago. She says the onset was after awaking from a liposuction surgery in Mexico, which was complicated by a cardiac arrest. Um, so here we have a wide field pseudocolor from this photo of the right eye. Vision is 2200. Uh, media looks clear. Disc margin itself looks sharp. Well, you do see this kind of peripapillary, or to say if it's atrophy, but kind of um, hyperpigmentation. Um, and then in the macula, you do see these kind of round, multifocal, hyperpigmented lesions. Um, out in the periphery here, similar type kind of hyperpigmentation. Um, the vasculature, Overall looks relatively normal and coarse in caliber. I agree. Um, so this is a more zoomed in photo of the macula and kind of we can better see this kind of peripapillary atrophy. Um, and then you see these hyperpigmented lesions. So these kind of darker ones to me look more chronic. Um, then these lesions, so this one kind of more in the center, and this one inferiorly kind of have a different appearance. They're hyper, hyperpigmented in the center, but then kind of have this hypopigmented halo around it. Um, mm -hmm. How long after the liposuction surgery was this? She said it was when she woke up that she noticed that the vision in the right eye was worse. But how long afterwards are these pictures? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, these pictures are approximately a month after surgery. Again, she was in Mexico when she actually had the surgery done. Um, so here we have the left eye, 
vision is also 2200. Media looks clear. Um, vessels, it's a little bit dark, but look overall normal. Maybe some attenuation out here in the periphery, although it's hard to say for sure. Um, disc margin itself looks crisp. Um, but then again, similar to the right eye, you see kind of this peripapillary atrophy. Um, and then similar looking lesions, hyperpigmented lesions in the macula. Um, and then as well as out here in the inferior periphery. I don't see any hemorrhages or any retinal whitening in right or left eye. Okay, so this is more zoomed in view of the macula. Again, these hyperpigmented hyperpigmented lesions. Um, and then this thing right here, it's hard to say. It looks maybe in the vitreous, could be a Weiss ring. Um, mm -hmm. Yep, I agree. Um, so fundus autofluorescence of the right eye. Um, you see this kind of hypo autofluorescence around the disc correlating to that peripapillary atrophy that we saw. Um, and then notably, we see this hyper autofluorescence involving most of the posterior pole here. You see this hypo autofluorescence correlating to those scars. Um, and then interestingly here, we kind of have this more hyper autofluorescence um, surrounding that lesion that kind of had that halo appearance. That could be unmasking of this scleral autofluorescence. Sure. We see that with uh, choroidal tumors. Once we're down to just bare sclera, sometimes it's slightly hyper autofluorescent because you're getting the unmasking of the sclera. Interesting. Left eye, again, um, this hypoautofluorescence correlating to the peripapillary atrophy, um, as well as these pigmented lesions that we saw on the color fundus photo and out in the periphery as well. Um, maybe some subtle hyperautofluorescence surrounding this kind of more central lesion here. So Mira, that U-shaped area mm -hmm. that we weren't really sure where infronasal to the disc. Mm -hmm. If you go down in, I have my pointer. Talking about this oh, here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that kind. Of, what do you think? Does that suggest it's at the level of the RPE? I don't know. It's hard to. It's hard to say. It's it's moved. Yeah. It, it's moved. I mean, that's that's vitreous. Yeah. Okay. So as you had suggested, a Weiss ring. Yeah. Um, IVFA of the right eye, we're at 23 seconds. Um, have fairly normal choroidal filling. Um, very, very early arterial filling of this one arterial here, and then superiorly, um, you do kind of see this um, hyperfluorescence around the disc, and then this um, hyper auto, uh, hyperfluorescence involving the posterior pole, similar pattern to what we saw in the fundus autofluorescence. Um, and then we do have this uh, um, hyperfluorescence surrounding that uh, lesion that we saw in the fundus autofluorescence as well. Mm -hmm. And then the little dots. Yeah, yeah. Maybe microaneurysm or something, it's hard to see. <clears throat> and here we are at 27 seconds, um, better arterial filling. Um, hard to say if we're, it doesn't look like we have any significant venous filling yet, so arterial fees. Um, again, see these focal areas of hyperfluorescence that we saw in the earlier frames um, in similar pattern here in the macula. Mm -hmm. 46 seconds, um, now we're in the full arterial venous phase, it looks like. Um, not much has changed really around the disc. You do see maybe some more hyperfluorescence here in that um, more central lesion. Um, and similar pattern here, and now we see 
kind of this area nasally, um, perhaps some telangiectatic vessels um, and some microaneurysms that are more apparent here. Left eye, minute and 31 seconds, um, full arterial venous phase, and we see kind of this diffuse hyperfluorescence um, around the disc, as well as around these hyperpigmented lesions here. Um, maybe some peripheral non-perfusion, um, these focal areas of hyperfluorescence, maybe some microaneurysms similar to the other eye. Um, and here out in the nasal periphery, um, maybe some peripheral non-perfusion and some hyperfluorescence around um, uh, the veins here. Um, later frame at four minutes and 38 seconds, now we see more of this um, kind of leakage around um, the veins here. Um, and then some peripheral non-perfusion out in the temporal periphery. Mm -hmm. And five minutes and 23 seconds in the right eye. Um, again, these telangiectatic vessels are lighting up. And then we do see kind of more prominent hyperfluorescence of these two lesions. Um, not really any robust leakage per se, but I guess we could call this staining. Um, so OCT. Uh, horizontal cut through the right eye. Um, so vitreous looks okay. Maybe some vitreous debris up here. Um, nerve fiber layer looks relatively normal. Um, we do have some thickening um, and disruption of the inner retinal layers um, overlying this kind of dome-shaped, appears to be subretinal lesion. Um, we do have a small cuff of subretinal fluid here. Um, and then there is disruption of the um, outer retinal layers here. Um, mm -hmm. um, so Another this look is, through it. Yeah, so vertical cut through a similar area. Um, again, we see this subretinal lesion with outer retinal disruption and then this overlying disruption of the inner retinal layers, a little bit of subretinal fluid. And then here this captures kind of these the six cystic changes within the inner retina. Um, and then this looks like um, a pigment epithelial defect here. Left eye, um, fairly horizontal cut. Um, vitreous looks normal, nerve fiber layer maybe a little bit thinner here overall. Um, inner retinal layers look okay. Um, we do see kind of this patchy disruption of the ellipsoid zone, and then we see this kind of more condensed hyperreflective lesion with some posterior shadowing, um, and then kind of adjacent to it, kind of this increased transmission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, into the choroid. Yeah. So her anterior segment exam was actually completely unremarkable, no inflammation, uh, no findings uh, of note. Differential for this? Do you think it had anything to do with her liposuction? Yeah, I think there's clearly been a process that's been going on longer than her liposuction. Um, could have been sudden realization um, after her surgery. Um, you know, the, I think the differential is fairly wide. I'd probably think about this in broad categories, um, infectious, inflammatory, and then kind of other. Um, so inflammatory, I think about um, some of our white dot syndromes. Um, you know, you think about um, PIC and multifocal choroiditis. Um, you can think about Azor. Um, infectious, I mean, there's not much vitreous inflammation. It'd be very atypical for toxo. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to know her refraction. I guess you could say she maybe had a mildly myopic looking fundus. Um, it's kind of an atypical pattern for myopic degeneration, especially with those more peripheral lesions. Um, you could ask about any <laughs> atypical like laser treatments. Um, 
yeah, those are kind of the broad, broad categories I would think about. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's how we were thinking. So either inflammatory, sarcoid, uh, some of the white dots like you mentioned, uh, maybe old chronic CSCR with these you know, pigmentary changes, even though we don't, and there was you know, the, the PED that we saw, uh, but probably less likely. And then also infectious etiology, syphilis, toxo, uh, presumed ocular histoplasmosis syndrome with all of these you know, pigmented lesions, some of which near the optic nerve. And then some degenerative causes, as you mentioned, myopic, unlikely to be AMD in this, uh, with this presentation and in this age range, uh, but trauma or some sort of iatrogenic injury to both eyes. So I'll give a little more background now. We've actually known about this patient for quite some time. She's been followed since 2012, though she's had very long gaps in follow-up. She had a history of intravitreal avastin twice in the right eye for choroidal neovascularization. And she was actually seen in clinic last 15 months ago, but at that time was totally quiescent, was just being observed. She had never had any documentation of active intraocular inflammation, and for that reason, POHS had been the favored diagnosis. She had had a remote infectious and inflammatory workup um, in previous years, uh, and all testing was negative. She did have prior uncontrolled type 2 diabetes, uh, which it might explain some of the microaneurysms and vascular abnormalities, um, but now had improved ever after uh, completing bariatric surgery a couple of years ago. So just to show a little bit of context, so this is how her pictures changed from 15 months prior to today. You can see that these halos are indeed new uh, and are relatively uh, central, at least in this area. And the left eye, while there's no halo lesions, you can see that the areas of atrophy have actually expanded in size, suggesting some sort of activity to the disease in the interim. Again, this hyper autofluorescence was not present a year and a half ago. And the left eye, take my word for it, the lid is, cuts it off a little bit here, but there are more lesions now noted inferiorly uh, in the left eye than were seen 15 months prior. You can see 15 months ago, there was focal disruption in the outer retina, which has now turned into this dome-like subretinal lesion, as you mentioned. And in the left eye, some maybe increased consolidation of these atrophic areas with less uh, subretinal hyperreflective material. So given the now active inflammation thought to be, uh, again, active because of the hyperautofluorescence, we felt that the diagnosis was more consistent with multifocal choroiditis and punctate inner choroidopathy rather than POHS. It was first described in 1969. Uh, it's a non-infectious idiopathic bilateral condition, which was actually referred to as resembling POHS. A later case series um, also added patients that had anterior uveitis adding to the name, uh, or adding the terminology with panuveitis to the diagnosis, or MFCPU. Watsky and colleagues characterized PIC, on the other hand, in 1984, which was described as small punctate yellow-gray dots in the posterior pole, later becoming atrophic scars with pigment without ocular inflammation. But since these initial descriptions, there's really no evidence since then to support that they are truly two separate and uh, independent uh, clinical entities. They're frequently seen in healthy myopic females, which our patient is. She was about a minus five sort of range myo. Uh, if there is inflammation anteriorly, the course is known to be more unremitting, uh, require more aggressive immunosuppression, and has a poor prognosis. And treatment, if associated with inflammation or has foveal threatening lesions, usually includes systemic steroids and immunomodulatory therapy. And notably, there is a very high risk of secondary CNV. So just a quick note about uveitis-related choroidal neovascularization. It's the third most common cause of CNV after AMD and myopia. They are typically type 2 lesions, that is, they are subretinal. And one interesting characteristic about inflammation-related uh, CNV is that you can sometimes see what is known as a pitchfork sign with these hyperreflective almost tendrils extending from the lesion up into the outer retina. Proangiogenic factors from inflammation or damage to Brooks membrane are thought to be causatory. Uh, and it may be challenging to diagnose this in the context of an underlying choroidal inflammatory process. Anti-VEGF has been shown to be effective, although there are no RCTs as there are in AMD. So our patient was treated uh, with intravitreal avastin and started on a 60 milligram PO prednisone taper. 
You can see that her subretinal lesion got smaller here and the subretinal fluid resolved, but she has quite a bit of outer retinal atrophy, which probably explains why her vision didn't improve. Wait, Final can, thoughts. Can you go back to the flu uh, a fundus autofluorescence? Yeah. So um, that the multifocal choroiditis explains the black spots, but then you've got the um, diffuse whiteness here, fundus autofluorescence, and then the little white spots as well. And that's more consistent with a MUDES-like response with multifocal choroiditis. Mm -hmm. And you can see that together. And it's now its own entity, MUDES-like response. And so I believe her. I, I think probably, you know, the trauma, et cetera, of the liposuction caused her to reactivate and developed this mutes like response with the multifocal choroiditis. That's so she's there. got both things together. All right. But I don't know that you have to postulate that. <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's a possibility. Long before fundus autofluorescence came out, it was known that you could have profound vision loss in cases of punctate interchoroidopathy, where the lesions clearly, the visible lesions clearly did not account for the decreased vision. And now we see this on, on fundus autofluorescence, so you can see that there's much more diffuse retinal involvement. The photoreceptors are just sort of stunned, and then that can get better. But, you know, it sounds like this is not a particularly perceptive patient, and I agree that this clearly has been there for a long time. Um, so she may have had all of this, if this is only a month, it's entirely possible she had this before she had the liposuction. So, in terms of therapy, if she remains, you said she was counting fingers at last visit. At last visit. So, yeah. as you mentioned, these are type two CNV lesions. So, if you want to, if she remains counting fingers and she was attuned to it, you could consider something like a subretinal surgery here, which we we do sometimes in these type two fibrotic neovascularization. And as you know, previously also for things like histo and limited CNV, you could consider things like. Uh, a limited translocation surgery. And these mutes like responses are now even seen with pseudoxanthomolasticum. So um, it's it's a pretty interesting new development. Great, thank you for those contributions. I see that we only have about a minute or so left. I've got one final case, which I kept short, but I'm not sure I kept it that short. So should we maybe hold that for another day? Yeah, let's hold it for the next one. Okay, very good. Well, thank you very much for all your uh, contributions, everyone.